Good morning or afternoon, everyone. I'm Megan Guevara with the Pretrial Justice Institute, and welcome to our JDI Connect webinar from the Virginia Department of Juvenile Justice, Transformation in Virginia, an overview of the VADJJ's transformation service continuum and regional service delivery model. We are excited to offer this as part of our Conference Connected series to be able to bring the JDI Intersight Conference to everyone, uh, whether you're going to Seattle or not. And usually all of our favorite part of the JDI Conference is being able to hear about the good work that's being done in different parts of the JDI world. So I'm excited uh, that the team from Virginia has joined us today to be able to talk about the work that they've been doing statewide. And before we get going, we're interested in hearing where everybody who's on the line is from. Um, if you could take a moment in the chat box and share with us what state you're from. We'd love to be able to know what part of the country's parts of the country are represented. And also, I'm going to pull up a poll question um, asking you what best represents your role in the system. Uh, are you a family member or support person for somebody who's involved in the youth justice system, an advocate, a community-based provider, a probation officer, mental health provider? Do you work in social services, secure detention, or someplace else? We'd love to know uh, where you're joining us from today. And taking a look at the chat box, it looks like we've got Indiana, South Dakota, Virginia, Texas, uh, lots of folks from Virginia logging in to support you all, Ohio, Colorado, who are on the line today. So don't be shy, tell us where you're from. And looks like we have folks who are joining us from the advocacy community. About half of our folks who have responded are from probation, a few from secure detention and social services, and a few other. Uh, for your other folks, if you'd also like to tell us in the chat box who you are, uh, where you're coming from, we would love to hear it. Right, share those poll results for you. So lots of interest from probation today. So for those of you from all over the country and especially from Virginia who are listening in today, uh, we're going to be talking about a brief overview of the Virginia DJJ transformation and with a highlight on the statewide continuum of services and an overview of the adoption of a regional service delivery model. Our faculty are going to share lessons learned and next steps and then we'll also have some time for Q&A at the end of the session. And if we don't have a time to get to all the questions here on the live session, we'll bring the conversation over to JDI Connect. Oh, we have a technical assistance provider and a deep end team leader who's one of our other folks and also state JDI administration. Welcome. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists today. We're joined by Valerie Boykin, who's the director of the Virginia Department of Juvenile Justice. Beth Stinnett, who's the statewide program manager um, from B VDJJ. Cora Scoots, who's the RSC model project director for the Eastern and Southern region from AMI Kids. And Kara Brooks, who's the RSC model project director for the Northern, Central and Western regions from Evidence-Based Associates. And so I will turn it over to you all to share with us the work that you've been doing in Virginia. Greetings. I'm Valerie Boykin, Director of the Virginia Department of Juvenile Justice. And I want to thank the NEA Casey Foundation for allowing us this opportunity to share with you today some of our transformation journey and in particular some of our accomplishments over the past five years. We owe a great deal of gratitude to our former visionary director, Andy Block, along with our former and current governors and our Secretary of Public Safety, Brian Moran, for their support during this time. And we want to also give a special thank you to the Virginia General Assembly, who graciously allowed, to, uh, allowed us to reinvest savings that we have heard from the closure of some of our facilities. But most importantly, I want to give a big shout out to the employees of the Virginia Department of Juvenile Justice because they've had the heaviest lift in our transformation efforts over the past five years. They have embraced learning new and different strategies and helping us to move forward by connecting with youth, families, communities, our providers, and our stakeholders in very different ways to move forward in our efforts across the Commonwealth. Today, our time is limited. So I'll provide you with a quick overview of our transformation 
and we'll focus more specifically on our regional service coordinator model that's been put in place to help us build a continuum of services across the Commonwealth. Our mission in the Department of Juvenile Justice is to protect the public by preparing court-involved youth to become successful citizens. And we've adopted in recent years the guiding principles of safety, connection, fairness, and purpose that we think are important not only to the youth and families that we work with, but also to the employees of the department. On this next slide, you'll see an overview of the uh, responsibilities or areas of, of operations that fall within DJJ's purview. We operate 32 court service units, and we now have one remaining juvenile correctional center, and we provide oversight over a number of additional resources and services across the Commonwealth that you'll see on your screen. On any given day in fiscal year 18, we served about 3,500 youth across the state, either through diversion programs or some level of supervision, services, or care. On this next slide, I want to begin to tell you a little bit about how our transformation began. Time is limited, so I'm going to move through this pretty quickly. But in 2014, when Andy Block, our former visionary leader, was appointed, he and Secretary Brian Moran asked the Annie Casey Foundation to come in and do an assessment of our system. We've had experience with the Casey Foundation since 2003, having been a JDAI site for a number of years. And so we were familiar with their work and embraced their, their opportunity to take a closer look. That assessment, along with some prior consultants' reports, indicated that we had outdated juvenile correctional centers, uh, that we needed smaller, safer, more cost-efficient facilities to better serve our youth. We learned that we were spending about 80% of our annual budget on about 10% of youth who actually penetrated to the deeper end of our system. And sadly, the results of, of those periods of confinement were not good. We learned that within three years' time, most of our youth were either returning to us on a subsequent commitment, or many of them were actually graduating on, graduating on to the adult criminal justice system. We learned that uh, we, had, uh, we did not have a continuum of placements. We used sort of a one-size-fits-all model, and that did not work for our population at the time. We also learned that we needed to find better and different ways to engage with families and engage with youth, and sadly, our system was not equitable. Our conclusion was we needed to reach the right youth with the right interventions at the right time. This next slide shows the framework of our strategic work. We embarked on an effort to reduce the overuse of secure confinement across our system. We wanted to reform our practices within our juvenile correctional centers. We wanted to replace the use of confinement with a statewide continuum of services. And we knew that we needed to use data to better drive our plans and decisions. And we wanted to embark on introducing new evidence-based and data-driven practices in probation and supervision throughout our system. In the next slides, I'll actually give you a little more specific on this particular strategic framework. This particular slide shows our, our data points from fiscal year 13 through fiscal year 18. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that our overall intake, our juvenile intake complaints, dropped significantly during that time. Now, while we can't take credit for those complaints coming into our door, either from law enforcement or citizens or schools wanting to complain about youth behavior, we can take credit for some of the accomplishments, excuse me, accomplishments that we've seen um, in the other boxes above that. So we have actually decreased the number of cases that are actually put forth to court significantly during that time. Uh, we have decreased the numbers of youth who are securely detained while they're awaiting court. Our probation placements have gone down significantly and our direct care admissions, those youth committed to state care have gone from 439 in fiscal year 13 to 325 in fiscal year 18. Ladies and gentlemen, that is significant. On this next slide, we share with you our detention population forecast. So if you'll see over a 10 year period, the numbers of youth securely detained has dropped by about 50%. The forecast the areas, the bar graph in gray shows the forecast going forward another five years, and you'll see that that trend is expected to continue, if not drop even more drastically um, over the next few years. So we are quite excited about these, these trends. On the next slide, 
I want to talk to you a little bit about how do we accomplish some of this. So as I mentioned earlier, we, we've begun to focus more specifically on our diversion practices. Our court service unit intake officers are looking more closely at who we divert from court, how we divert from court, and finding resources in the community that can better address their needs. Virginia's a part of the KC Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initi Initiative, JDAI. We have been, as I said earlier, since 2003, and we currently have eight sites. We have borrowed from that, those learnings to introduce new practices throughout our court service units. We have embarked upon using three structured decision-making tools, one being the Detention Assessment Instrument, or DAI. We also are using the YASI, the Youth Assessment and Screening Instrument, as our risk and needs assessment that we use in various capacities throughout our department. And our third uh, structured decision-making tool is the standardized dispositional matrix. This matrix uh, is being rolled out as we speak across the 34 court service units in Virginia, the 32 state operated and two locally operated districts to give better guidance to probation officers in making recommendations at disposition before the court. We use the risk need risk responsivity model which, help, which helps us to determine who needs what service and how to best introduce that service so that it will have positive outcomes for youth and families. We work very hard on service matching and dosage and you'll hear more about that as we talk about our regional service coordinator model. We have implemented statewide the use of effective practices in community supervision or EPICS and in addition to providing supervision and surveillance for young people in the community we're also teaching them skill building. We are using a wider range array of incentives and sanctions across our service delivery model and helping them to learn and use different skills to make better decisions in their everyday life. Next, we'll talk a little bit about some of the progress that we've seen in residential services. This particular slide depicts the decrease in the use of a secure juvenile detention center. And as of January of this year, 40% of our youth were served in alternative placements versus a secure juvenile detention center. This next slide helps us to look at how we've done this. So in 2015, we embarked upon a new length of stay system with the help of the Casey Foundation and a lot of data and research from our internal folks and, and other technical assistance providers, we learned that uh, Virginia had one of the longest lengths of stay in the nation and sadly young people who stayed more than 15 months had a greater or faster return into um, our system or the adult system. So we adjusted our length of stay and in fiscal year 14 the average length of stay was about 18 and a half months and we're now down to just over 12 months. We've implemented a new community treatment model based on the Missouri model in part in our lone remaining juvenile correctional center. As I said earlier, we are engaging families in different ways. We have created a family engagement council. We have uh, sponsored visitation so that families can visit youth on a monthly basis through free transportation. So they're a better and bigger part of our overall programming in the facility. And we created a student, student government association with former Governor McAuliffe who allowed his chief counsel to help our young people develop um, a constitution which the governor actually signed with them. On this next slide, you'll also see additional aspects of our residential care. In 2015, we closed the Reception and Diagnostic Center. In 2017, we closed Beaumont, our largest juvenile correctional center, and combined that with Bonaire. And thankfully, the Virginia General Assembly allowed us to reinvest those funds, about $40 million, to help build a continuum of services across the Commonwealth. Currently, we have a wide array of services, and you'll hear more about this, but that includes 10 community placement programs in detention centers that provide dedicated beds to provide therapeutic treatment to young people placed closer to home in their communities, which allows for greater um, family involvement and greater involvement with outside providers who can begin services prior to release. We also, in detention centers, provide detention reentry in another set of detention centers. 
We have grown our residential treatment provider uh, network, and you'll hear more about that and other options as we go further into the presentation. We believe that through our efforts, we're actually seeing youth with higher risk and more serious offenses committed during this time. And those are probably the right youth who need secure care and confinement to help with their rehabilitation. So those numbers have gone from 65% high risk offenders to 81% in just five fiscal years. And those youth have 59% person felonies coming into our system. This next slide shows some of our improvements in the educational services arena. There's a lot of information here and I'm told the slides will be made available to you for your review later. But I do want to highlight that we have significant numbers of young people actually graduating from high school in our system these days. 90%, over 90% in the last couple of years who were eligible seniors have graduated. And this past June, we had 68 students who celebrated either the receipt of a diploma or a GED from our um, Yvonne B. Miller School located at the Bonnier campus. This next slide shows some improvements in our areas of reentry. We looked very closely at some of our practices and partnered with a number of other child serving agencies to help uh, bring in new programs and services to help transition young people into the community. We now have an expedited Medicaid enrollment processes for those eligible. We are getting ID cards prior to release and we've expanded the array of independent living and reentry programming in the community. On this next slide, I wanted to just highlight very briefly some of our efforts in SUSTAIN. We have worked a lot on our programming for young people, but realized the true success in all the work that we do is going to be ensuring that our staff get it, that our staff are part of the process, are buying into the change and owning it. And so we believe that those guiding principles of safety, fairness, purpose are applied to our staff as well as the young people involved in our system. We are promoting a culture of learning. And as we learn, we grow and we expand that across our system. So we are prioritizing the way we make decisions and using data to support those decisions. On the next slide, you'll see a few things that we're focusing on during this current fiscal year. I want to highlight that our work is not done. We've only begun in a number of these areas and there's much to be done. As we learn more, for instance, about trauma-informed care, we're trying to partner with other child serving agencies to better address this across our continuum. And this last bullet here is on equity. I said as I began that uh, we learned in the assessment in 2014 that our system is not equitable. At every point in our system, youth of color are overrepresented and it's more highly visible for those young people who penetrate and are actually committed to our system. We're hoping that through things like our standardized, excuse me, standardized disposition matrix and other efforts that will have some impact on that. However, I'll repeat again, our work is not done. I have very quickly given you an overview of our transformation. On this next slide, I do want to highlight that there are more resources available to you about this on our website. One in particular is our, excuse me, our strategic framework. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see a link to actually um, find that on our website, along with uh, annual transformation reports that we've submitted to the General Assembly. We're happy to answer any questions that you might have about our transformation framework. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Beth Stinnett to talk to you more specifically about our building of the continuum for youth in our system. Beth? Thank you, Director uh, Boykin, for providing us with an overview of our transformation here in Virginia. I've been very proud to be part of that transformation and, and I'm very pleased to be able to be with you here today to talk about the part of the transformative work that is um, focused on building a more robust continuum of services for children. So I thought one of the things that might be helpful as we get started in the discussion is to describe, indicate what we mean by continuum. It's, it's a word that our field uses pretty broadly and, and certainly a word that's in broad use here in Virginia. And so in Virginia, we use the word continuum to describe our full complement of services and interventions and across a broad range of levels of legal involvement 
uh, with the juvenile court. We also use the word to describe interventions and services that are being provided by to a, a number of different target populations and by a number of different individuals, including our own staff being the, the primary interventionist oftentimes in cases. Um, and while we do contract with specialists for a variety of services, our, our staff serve, again, as the primary interventionists and are very much part of our continuum of services as well. When we speak about con the continuum, we're also talking about government to government partnerships, that we have young people who, uh, we have partnerships with local government that provide a lot of our services as well. And then finally, contracted services, whether those are community-based or residential. There are four different distinct parts, I would say, of our continuum. And um, Megan, if you would get back, there are four different parts of our, our continuum. So when we talk about continuum, we're talking about the continuum of pretrial alternatives to detention for young people. Uh, and those are primarily provided here in Virginia by local government agencies. We're also talking about a continuum of diversion and early intervention services. And again, that's primarily, uh, those are primarily provided by local government as well. And then finally, the two parts of our continuum that we'll spend the most time talking about today is we're talking about a continuum of intervention and services for youth who are on supervision, whether that's probation or parole, and the portion of our continuum that is direct care placement options. I also thought it might be helpful um, to all as we get started with the discussion to give you a bit of a historical context that while we have uh, new services and um, we're adding to a, a more robust array, we have a, a long history of providing services, of course, to young people. And so a bit of a historical context of what services existed prior to uh, our transformation and what types of funding sources uh, predate our transformation and that we continue to have access to. Not unlike other states, um, certainly you know, the services that we're able to contract for and provide as the Department of Juvenile Justice and the funding streams that we have are not enough to meet the full needs of young people. And so we have blended and braided funding. Uh, well, the first funding source that I'll tell you about is what we call CSA or Children's Services Act funds that were named for a law that was enacted in 1993. And so that law established a single state pool of funds to support services for youths and families. And it's a combination of state funds and required local, man uh, local matches and managed by local interagency teams that oversee the services. And while this has been a long established uh, pool of funding and one that we continue to need here in Virginia, it has had some limitations for our de uh, Department of Juvenile Justice population of young people because they're considered a non-mandated population. And so the availability of funds is variable across jurisdictions. Uh, another long-standing funding source that we have here in Virginia is the Virginia Community Crime Control Act funding or what we call VJCCCA funds. Um, also has been in existence since the early or actually the mid 90s since 1996 and has a primary population uh, target population of alternatives de to detention. It came about at a time where uh, communities were building new facilities, new detention facilities, and that was absent having viable alternatives to detention. So that's one of the primary target populations as well as diversion and early intervention. And so those, those are funds that are administered by our agency and that they are uh, administered to entities of local government, all 133 cities and counties across Virginia through a formula grant. So those are long established funding sources, ones that we continue to have um, and that are part of the, uh, the front end of our system, particularly with BJCCCA funding. In addition to that, we have dedicated DJJ funding, state funding, uh, that predates our transformation that predominantly provides uh, funds and services for young people who are on probation and parole. Uh, prior to our transformation, worth noting is that while we did have some services, we had what was called mental health initiative funding that provided uh, for us to have commingled mental health physicians that at at least 20 of our probation offices for some direct access to services. Uh, and we also had services that we call transitional services funding uh, or re-entry funding. And so one of the things that we recognized that it was a shortcoming previously is that we really were dedicating most of our resources 
to the back end of the system and that services were available primarily to young people once they came out of facilities but were not available while they were still in the community on probation and when it could be impactful to avoiding out of home placement. Uh, Director Boykin mentioned that um, one of the things that we've been very fortunate as the General Assembly after the closure of a large correctional center there was cost savings associated and we've been given the latitude to reinvest those funds in community-based alternatives and so with the addition of additional funding and being able to purchase more services we recognize that we had a very limited internal capacity to contract for those services and also to manage the provider directory, the provider network, sorry, even within the existing um, amount of services that we had. So we needed a different process, whether that was an internal or an external one. So in readiness for that and, and recognizing that we needed more services and that we would continually have additional funding uh, to reinvest, we knew that we needed to create some infrastructure to manage that. So what we made the decision to do in 2016 was to adopt what we now call a regional service delivery model to manage portions of our continuum, primarily services for young people who are on probation and parole or who are in direct care. Um, we issued a request for proposals to select two companies two regional service coordination companies that we hired in 2016, AMI Kids and Evidence-Based Associates to manage our continuum and our service provision and went live with referrals on January 2017. And I'll tell you a little bit about the goals. I mentioned that we had limited internal capacity uh, to manage this. So that was one of our considerations. We knew that we needed to um, have the infrastructure, we needed to increase the efficiency of our system, and it also allowed us to redeploy some DJJ staff that we were cur had currently serving as service coordinators and to be able to, um, with a number of other competing priorities, allowed us to redeploy them to work on our court service unit practice reforms. Uh, one of the other goals is to was to reduce an over-reliance on more restrictive settings, supervision and compliance strategies that we knew were not adequately addressing risk or need. Um, we also knew that we needed to provide services to youth at multiple stages of court and DJJ involvement. I mentioned that we were primarily providing services to young people following stays in direct care as opposed to on the front end of the system while they were still in the community. And just to, to increase the sheer array and availability of services for young people as well. Um, we knew that we had limitations with in some jurisdictions not having access to even basic services. So we wanted to grow the number of services that we had available as well as our provider network. Um, and importantly, one of our considerations was not just to have basic services in place, but to increasingly add services to our continuum across a broad spectrum of evidence and to ensure that we were introducing evidence-based and evidence-informed models. Um, lastly, two other things that were really big considerations to us in adopting this model and some goals. To eliminate what we call justice by geography and increase our gender, I'm sorry, increase our geographic um, equity. We knew that to the extent that we did not have basic services in some parts of the state that um, we were inadvertently causing young people possibly to penetrate deeper into the juvenile justice system um, just because of not having access to services that, that they needed. So we certainly wanted to do our part to eliminate that and to be sure that children have access to basic services no matter their zip code. And then finally, one of the limitations in our previous system was needing to uh, sometimes becoming aware of service needs or needing to add new providers, but having to wait until there were open procurement um, windows of opportunity when requests for proposals were submitted through our state contracting. And so we now have an ability with our new model to add services and providers in real time when they're needed. Um, a few other key concepts and so some things that we did when we put out this request for proposals to select one or more companies to manage this process for us. We knew that we wanted to include that they would coordinate services for us and that they would process referrals from our staff. 
Uh, we also knew that we were going to need help in assessing where our service gaps existed and help in growing our provider network. Um, and then even putting together systems for centralized billing and centralized reporting. Uh, we also knew that we very much needed help in standing up new services again that were across a broad spectrum of evidence and to introduce evidence-based models in Virginia that for the most part did not currently exist. And then lastly, in a next generation of this work that we'll tell you more about, is that we knew that we um, really wanted to put a lot of practices in place in order to monitor the quality of our providers um, so that we could monitor for outcomes and um, to put performance measures in place for the provider community and have fidelity oversight with evidence-based models as well. And then a few other notes about um, this model. We knew that we wanted, and these are some of the things that we included in the request for proposal for our companies, that we knew that we needed to do a better job of aligning services using what we know, using the evidence, using the risk and responsivity model, and do a better job of aligning our risk assessment results or results from assessments uh, to service matching and to prioritize those criminogenic needs that are things that could break cycles of offending for young people. We also need that we needed to have them focus on the dosage of what young people are receiving in terms of services. And you heard Director Boyd can talk about one of our goals being the right youth, the right intervention, the right time. And of course, it also includes in receiving the right dosage of services. And then finally, in terms of responsivity, uh, like other systems that we knew that we have a number of barriers to service provision that included uh, primarily transportation and language barriers, as well as needing to be responsive to trauma. And so those were things that we knew that we needed for them to build into services as well. Um, and then finally, some other programming considerations is that we knew that we wanted to contract with more providers who were using cognitive behavioral techniques and role rehearsing, rehearsal with young people uh, who were actively in, engaging families and that we knew that we needed the services that would be arranged in a continuum uh, of service in terms of arrangement and delivery as well. So at, at this time, I'm um, very pleased to be able to have the lead from each of our regional service coordination companies to tell you more about the regional service coordination model and, and the processes that are in place and some of the services that have been stood up under the model as well. Thank you, Beth. Hi, I'm Kara Brooks. I'm the um, project director for Evidence-Based Associates and EBA. We oversee the north, central, and western part of the state, and those are highlighted on the map. Cora. Good afternoon. I'm Cora Skews. I am the AMI Kids project director um, for the eastern and southern regions. All right. So um, I wanted to let you all know a little bit about how we how we started. This was a very big project. So um, what the first thing we wanted to do is get a network of quality providers. So what we did was we leveraged providers that were already working with Department of Juvenile Justice. And we put out a formal RFQ uh, request for qualifications for those providers to submit their qualifications um, to each regional service coordinator. So we had the same RFQ, but they still submitted separately depending on which region they wanted to serve. Um, that's how we started. And then in about 2018, we, well, we decided to keep it as an ongoing process um, because we didn't want to limit providers that maybe missed the, the initial um, RFQ or if we had provide the previous slide. Um, we didn't want to, we wanted to make sure that we kept it open so that providers could continue to apply and um, make sure that we were looking at all the regions and services, uh, making sure that all services were available in all regions. Um, and now we're focusing more on targeted application. So providers that are meeting an unfilled need um, and also utilizing some services like language and transportation to make sure that we are filling any kind of services or gaps that we may um, have. Uh, next. 
these are the these are the services that we looked at when we were putting together the request for qualification. So we looked at traditional clinical services ones that are um, traditionally funded through Medicaid and, and other insurance like outpatient therapy, including individual and family, um, intensive in-home services, mental health skill building, and um, substance abuse services. We also looked at um, non-Medicaid services and skill-based services and monitoring services. So those are ones with um, that had a specific focus like um, serving youth with sexualized behaviors or substance, other additional substance abuse services, life skills coaching, high fidelity wraparound, employment services, and electronic monitoring. We also looked at residential programming. So these are for youth, um, the 18 and over that are coming, um, that are stepping out um, on parole or direct care, which are direct care is our youth that are currently committed um, committed youth and need a, an alternative placement that um, also would meet the residential treatment facilities criteria, um, some of their clinical criteria. Um, and then we also were looking at evidence-based services, which we will talk in more detail in upcoming slides. So we had those as kind of our broad uh, services that we, were, that we were adding, but we realized that we needed more standardized service descriptions um, and also standardized, you know, generalized categories. So we developed um, these seven categories, broke them into assessments, evaluations, residential programs, service enhancements, uh, clinical services, non-clinical services, monitoring and case um, and service enhancements are not necessarily services provided one-on-one -on -one or to families, but those are things like um, length, uh, additional services that we would add to a service, like um, a trans translation services um, to reduce those language barriers or transportation services. Um, these uh, generalized categories also help us when we are developing reports and um, submitting um, you know, analyzing our data to see which services are most utilized and assessing where the gaps in services are. Next. When we were looking at the evidence-based models, um, the top two, functional family therapy and multi-systemic therapy were two, those are two highly regarded models um, that are being utilized in a lot of states and they are very well established. They have um, established fidelity measures and adherence measures, and they have that national oversight and training. The bottom two are, you know, are working towards the, the more stringent fidelity measures, but they still have a, that national standards and national training. Um, those two, the bottom two trauma-focused uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and high fidelity wrap intensive care coordination were previously launched by the, the Department of Virginia, uh, Virginia Department of Behavioral Health, as well as the um, Office of Children's Services. But now we had made them um, additionally available through the regional service coordination model. Um, previously, trauma-focused CBT, that had been um, a widely used, serv um, I guess, more of a training technique and we wanted to make sure that we were um, tightening up the standards and were able to use it as a standalone service and not just a training model. So next, um, I will turn it over to Kara to talk about how we stood up functional family therapy and multi-systemic therapy through the state of Virginia. Thank you. And on the next slide, you will see um, some bulleted points. Um, as Beth indicated, the these were two evidence-based models that were written into the request for proposals. So this was from the beginning, this was the intent of, um, part of the intent of the transformation. So EBA and AMI work to uh, learn our regions, understand the volume of kids, and then make recommendations to DJJ about where MST and FFT team could, team could be launched to one, um, meet the needs within that community, but then also make sure that we were accessing services and providing those services across the state. Um, we also looked at the potential um, catchment areas. We looked at rate structures, um, and then we looked at the sustainability of that volume over time. Um, we wanted to make sure that when we launched those teams that they were able to be successful. 
We um, developed and published a request for proposal or an intent to negotiate to select those providers um, for the MST and FFT teams. And then um, each regional service coordination agency helps support and launch those evidence-based models. The Department of Juvenile Justice helped um, assist with the startup funding and the training and licensing fees. Those were seen as a, a barrier to the provider community. So overcoming that, we were able to select some very qualified providers to be able to do that. And then we worked with those providers, with the network partners, with the evidence-based models, um, and the community to really educate the community of these new programs that were not previously um, accessible in the communities. Um, when we launched these teams, we knew that um, DJJ would get the first pick um, and that they would have the utilization, but we also needed to make sure that we looked at other financial barriers down the road. So we really started with that sustainability in mind in those um, steps for that implementation. On the next slide, you'll see prior to the transformation, pre-RSC model, there were two existing MST teams um, within the state of Virginia. Those were the only two um, that predated the transformation. And at that point in time, those MST teams could serve about 30 to 35 kids on any given day. As um, the project rolled out, the transformation um, with the Regional Service Coordination took over in January 1 for the services. And that first year, we launched 10 teams, six MST teams and four FFT teams. And then in 2018, um, there was a team that we were able to help successfully relaunch into the community. And then in 2019, just in the last couple of months, there have been two new functional family therapy teams that have launched. Our current capacity is 380 kids at any given day can be served by those MST and FFT teams. So going from 30 MST to now 150 MST and 235 FFT teams. On the next slide, you can see a map um, of the um, state of Virginia and you will see a little dot in almost every county. Um, we are only missing two or three communities right now that do not have access to MST or FFT. Um, our most recent launch in 2019 is serving that western part of the state that is um, a more rural um, community and so they're serving a very large geographic area. This map also overlays against the number of commitments, the DJJ map of the number of youth committed in each jurisdiction. So you'll see those darker communities. Those were teams where we um, started in the initial launch in 2017. Um, and then trickling down to the regions that have um, fewer commitments are the teams that have just recently launched. Um, it's pretty exciting to see that, uh, that map filled up now. So the next slide highlights um, with MST and FFT, we have about 100 services or more that we can offer to a community. And all of those services begin with a request from the probation officer. Um, unlike Medicaid or um, other services that are um, other funding streams, the request is coming from the person completing the assessment and the evaluation, not from a provider and not directly from the parent. So the court service unit is making that um, request for that referral based on their internal risk assessments, based on their case plan, based on the youth criminogenic needs. And then the regional service coordinators that work with EBA and AMI are scattered throughout the state. They're very familiar with those communities and they work with um, that probation officer, that referring staff to look and make that best match. Um, so they, that may be a case staffing, it may be reviewing the materials. We also look at any barriers the family has that we may need to add a service enhancement. We may need to look at availability if there's a program that has a waiting list. So there's a lot that goes into reviewing that packet and making sure that we are aligning with that youth with the very best possible service. And then that authorization comes from the regional service coordinator to the provider and they're authorizing um, the dosage, um, the amount of services, the um, start dates, uh, when do we need it to start, and then um, sending that authorization to the court service units. And then we um, monitor that service moving forward. But really that continued um, thread of the right use with the right intervention at the right time throughout that referral process. And then on the last slide, you can see um, the volume that we have. Um, in 2018, we started with, we served 100, um, about 1,500 unduplicated youth. Now those also come in very large packets. So there was um, over almost 
2,300 referrals that came in, and we served a total of 1,500 kids. Um, and the services then authorized were about 3,500. So there's often times where a youth may get two services. We may start with a psychological or um, an assessment of some form, and then they get a service to follow up. Um, 2019, in fiscal year 2019, those numbers did increase. We served about 2,000 kids um, youth and with about 4,000 services. We find um, assessments are utilized um, most frequently, psychologicals, substance abuse evaluations, and psychosexuals, um, youth with services or assessments for youth with sexualized behaviors. And then the actual services that we utilize the most in the last couple of years has been a life skills coaching, um, MST and SFT, and then specialized therapies, which may also include um, substance abuse counseling or services for youth with sexualized behavior or a it would have to have a qualified sex offender treatment provider provide those services. So it has continued to grow in the referrals. And for the next slide, um, we do a lot of referrals, but I'll pass uh, back to Cora for the other pieces that the regional service coordinators do. Thank you. Um, so beyond the addition, so in addition to the, the contracting, the standardized service descriptions, centralized referrals, startup of FFT and MSD, um, and evidence-based programs who are also responsible for um, centralized billing, um, centralized reporting, and ongoing um, continuous quality improvement. Um, so, so some of those things that I discussed that includes maintenance of provider directories, um, having standardized service rates uh, between both regional service coordination models, uh, uh, agencies, having um, providing ongoing provider support and potential training um, that they request, uh, having different um, standardized onboarding procedures, um, developing logic models with providers so the uh, referral source knows exactly what that um, service looks like and what the outcomes look like before they request it. Um, also developing service matrices, so we have to standardize length of stay, um, or uh, it still depends on, on the youth's needs, but we do have kind of a, a matrix of what, um, what initial, initial authorization versus an, an, an ongoing authorization. And uh, most excitingly for uh, this fiscal year, we are developing um, or implementing a quality improvement um, and quality assurance plan. So this includes ongoing um, oversight and monitoring for activities for the, the direct service providers, as well as more formalized processes, um, which includes uh, stakeholder surveys and feedback. Um, we do quality improvement plans. We do formal, um, we will be doing formal on-site reviews and formal um, desk reviews and, um, and compliance uh, reviews to make sure providers are meeting all of those standards. That wraps it up. I will turn it back to Beth and Valerie to talk about next steps. Thank you very much to uh, Kara and to Cora for walking us through the, the regional service coordination model. And Megan, if you would give back, please, two, two steps. Um, just wanted to share with you, thank you for to Cora for wrapping this up and talking about the next steps on, on behalf of the regional service coordinators and the next generation of that work. Um, in, in addition to that, to, to borrow some any KCJDAI language, um, you know, as an agency, we certainly have next steps as well as we continue to try to do better and go deeper. And so a few things that, that we'll leave you with that we you know, think are the next generation of our work as an agency. Uh, one of the things we know that we need to continue to do is to assess our needs and identify additional programming. Uh, we know that there are additional adaptations of MST and FFT that are in consideration for us, particularly one that's for youth with sexualized behaviors. Uh, so we're constantly looking to see what other services we can when add to our, our menu and using data to do that. We also uh, think it's very important that we look at not just those programs that are evidence-based, but also look at those that are across a broad spectrum of evidence and to look at innovative programming as well. So we're currently looking at the potential to uh, bring to Virginia programming that is a credible messenger and restorative justice models as well. 
Um, we also know that we need to continue not just to look at evidence-based practices um, external to ourselves with the provider community, but how important it is that we continue to do that within our court service unit. So Director Boykin, you know, said to you early on that we have a renewed focus on the front end of our system. So we're going to continue in the next generation of our work, we'll continue to work on our JDAI sites and to work on our diversion and intake practices and also to continue to work on our implementation support and our fidelity to our youth assessment and screening instrument as well as our statewide model of, of intervention epics. And then finally, we're um, really excited about the rollout of our standardized disposition matrix and in, in, in part see a, a direct connection with the work that we're doing for service provision as well. We know that our standardized disposition matrix, we believe, we hope, can help to inform our courtroom decision making and ensure that our, um, our recommendations to the court rather, and to ensure that we are uh, making decisions that are consistent with level of bending or risk and that if we um, and, and how that's directly related to service provision. We hope that we can avoid bringing young people into the system just for their social needs and for their service needs and we can help them connect with other agencies. Um, we also know that we need to continue to redefine our direct care placement process. We are uh, wanting to continue to increase the capacity, uh, but also the utilization of our alternative settings for direct care. Um, I believe that we said previously we now have 36 different options for young people um, in lieu of correctional centers and so we want to broaden our utilization for those over the course of the next year and continue to look at our, our processes and our decision making about um, how we're utilizing those placements as well. Um, and Cora left you with, in talking about our service coordination model, how we very much want to focus on service quality and outcomes in the new year. So we've been working with our regional service coordination companies with rolling out, with developing and, and rolling out a monitoring plan for our service providers. We have other parts of that as well. Um, they've been working with the direct service providers and the direct development of logic models on what's complete those will be foundational to us creating a service matching matrix for use by our staff as well. And we're also continuing to analyze data. Um, we have a phenomenal in-house capacity to research uh, and to analyze data. And we're going to be doing our first run on the performance measures that we've put in place for our regional service coordinators. Um, we are also in the early stages of adopting what's called the Standardized Program Evaluation Protocol, or SPEP, that you may be aware of, that's going to help to um, enhance our internal capacity to evaluate programs. And we have a partnership with Child Trends to do an independent evaluation of our RSC model as well. And then finally, DJJ cannot uh, do this alone, that we are very fortunate to work closely with our sister agencies. Uh, other state agencies here in the Commonwealth child serving agencies and that there are a number of parallel transformation efforts underway with the Department of Social Services, the Department of Behavioral Health, and with Medicaid expansion and redesign in Virginia. So we're very uh, fortunate to be working very closely with those agencies to align our practices and to prepare for the rollout of the Family First Prevention Services Act. And I'm going to so, ask if Director Boykin wants to share some final words with us as well. As we prepare to see if there are any questions, I just wanted to mention that I was appointed director of the agency in late April of this year. Prior to that, I served as deputy director for community programs and had the opportunity to work very closely with Beth, Cora, and Kara as we stood up these programs. And I'm so incredibly pleased and proud of the great work that they've done. I mentioned earlier the heavy lift by staff, but these young ladies have done a tremendous job in three short years to build capacity as we truly continue to work to build a continual services for youth and families across the Commonwealth. So we'll turn it over to Megan to see if there are any questions. We've provided a lot of information to you in a very short period of time. And thank you as you walk this journey with us. Megan? Thank you so much uh, for all of your contributions. We do have a couple of questions coming in. Um, first is, you mentioned renewed focus on the front end of our system, specifically diversion. How are you deciding which charges are being diverted and are children receiving multiple diversions? 
The Code of Virginia allows for multiple diversions and our intake officers have wide discretion in making those decisions about which cases are most appropriate for diversion in Virginia. More often than not, they are first offense misdemeanor charges that are diverted. Uh, we are required to also, in, in matters of children in need of services that might be truants or what we want to do as incorrigibles, to ensure that appropriate steps are taken through alternative resources in the community before any of those types of charges are filed. Uh, in some situations, youth are referred to diversion more than once. There's no hard and fast rule about that, but we try to ensure that intake officers are receiving appropriate treatment, uh, excuse me, appropriate training and guidance in making those decisions about when and how cases are diverted from court. Thank you, Valerie. And our next question is about community-based providers. How are DJJ and service coordinators thinking about helping community-based providers gain access to this new system? What kinds of outreach support and other kinds of assistance do you think would be the most helpful to these providers who are often overlooked or shut out from traditional government programs? Uh, Megan, I was gonna say, I can get us started on that. And then I think that Kara and Cora both have really great examples of things they're doing to um, engage the provider community, both existing providers and potential new providers and, and processes that are in place. A um, couple of things that we've done very uh, deliberately, um, some education to the broader provider community. We've taken advantage of a number of opportunities to get in, in front of provider organizations and associations to reach providers um, for education. We actually, the first, we had a, a different live, live webinar also that was hosted by um, your group where we brought together stakeholders that were potential providers on the front end a few years ago to explain the new model that we're going to and, and to encourage um, they're very much to educate themselves and to consider applying. As part of that, we also did regional based outreach and had two gentlemen from Justice um, System Partners, J JSP, um, who went around the state with us and we did regional based listening sessions and uh, educational sessions to educate the provider community about what works in juvenile justice and evidence based principles. So, um, outreach and, and education has been a part of that. And the last thing I'll mention before turning it over to Kara and Cora is I believe it was during uh, Kara's presentation, she mentioned that we, we had two MST teams in Virginia. There was a capacity to serve 35 young people through MST. There's now a capacity on any given day through MST or FFT to serve 380, uh, I believe, youth and families uh, on any given day. And part of the reason that that didn't exist before, we know is that sometimes those services can be cost prohibitive. So we wanted to eliminate that potential barrier, particularly for smaller companies. And so we use some of our reinvestment funds to pay for the necessary training and startup so that it would incentivize those models existing here. And Kara and Cora, you can give them a couple of other examples of things you're doing to educate the provider community and engage them and, and to solicit new providers as well. Um, I can start. Um, one thing that AMI Kids has done is, um, you know, even though it, we may not be, um, you know, reaching out right now and, and really trying to solicit a, a bunch of providers, because we do have a pretty um, extensive network, we are providing that one-on-one -on -one support to any provider that may have questions about the model or um, want to know, you know, before they submit an application or a proposal, what would they be getting themselves involved in? So we, we uh, you know, we're, we're available to answer questions or meet in person. Um, we also will go out to, if it was a, if they had a facility, um, maybe it was a residential facility or even a community-based facility, we can go out and, and talk with them one-on-one -on -one about that um, and, and talk about how to become, um, what would be involved in um, once they became a direct service provider to make sure that um, it, it's a benefit, beneficial for both parties. Thank you so and much. And I would say with each I would say with EBA, we are keeping um, our website up to date as to what we what type of providers we need. We serve a much more rural community than AMI kids, and so we have pockets of need. And the small provider, big provider, that doesn't really matter to us. Um, the ability to 
roll um, somebody into our network very quickly or timely has been a huge benefit in filling service gaps. Um, we are careful now about opening, you know, the 12th provider of the same, that provides the exact same service because we've also found that can be very frustrating to providers to work through the hoops and um, become a contracted provider with us and then not get referrals. So we really are working towards that refining quality services, making sure that we're doing the best um, that we can by the kids and families we're serving, but then also um, providing those opportunities. So we've, we bring new providers on quite frequently, but we are very much targeting our areas where there may be service gaps. Megan, uh, one last thing from DJJ's perspective, while we value evidence-based practices that have proven to be effective with populations, we also know that oftentimes it's folks that are indigenous to those communities where children live that have the most credibility. And so Beth mentioned earlier, our interest in looking at the credible messenger model, but we also have an interest down the road in doing some grant making to local providers of services that maybe don't or haven't met that threshold to become an evidence-based provider. So stay tuned, there's more to come in that area as we do more research and figure out how we might become a grant maker in this, in this business and teach small and up, up and coming um, businesses and, and, and those who want to do well by youth and families how to, how to play with the big boys. So we're interested in that in the future. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valerie, Beth, Kara, and Cora uh, for all that you've shared with us today. Uh, we do have a couple of additional questions we don't have time for, so um, I'd love to invite you all to keep the conversation going in JDI Connect. We will post uh, the slides, the recording, uh, the link to the strategic planning document that was referenced, and welcome all of you to continue to ask the folks in Virginia about their good work, and we're excited to hear about your next steps uh, as things keep moving forward. And thanks to all of our participants today. And we hope to see you at our next Conference Connected event. Uh, we'll be sharing some materials from the conference in Seattle, as well as we've got some additional exclusive webcasts. You can check the event calendar in JDI Connect for those. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their Wednesday. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care.